It's now my pleasure to introduce Governor Dirk Kempthorne, President and CEO of ACLI, our secure family partner in this tax reform effort and in this very congressional conference. During his time in public life as mayor of Boise, in the U.S. Senate, as governor of Idaho, and as secretary of the interior, Governor Kempthorne understood the value of citizen engagement in government and the particularly important role that the insurance and financial services industry plays in the very fabric of American society. On behalf of NAFA's leadership and members everywhere, I want to thank ACLI for placing the Secure Family ad in this week's Roll Call publication on Capitol Hill. This ad placement will enhance our visits with members of the House and the Senate tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, our good friend, Governor Dirk Kempthorne. Thank you, Governor. You're doing a great job. Kevin, thank you very much. Um, your CEO, Kevin, he demonstrates his personality. Uh, I know that he came to you from the Institute of Internal Auditors. <laughs> now, I love auditors. This has to be a lot more fun, these good advisors out here. But I want to thank you for uh, inviting me back. I want to compliment you, Kevin, on your leadership of NAFA. You are a true advocate for this magnificent industry. I also want to recognize Diane Boyle, who's been instrumental in organizing this conference. It's no surprise that Diane has been called a member of the A-Team for her work on behalf of brokers and advisors. <laughs> and a thank you to Gary Sanders and his team for working collaboratively with ACLI on many, many of the issues at the NAIC and in the states including the producer licensing, exam reimbursements for our nation's military veterans. And we're all better for the leadership provided this year by your very, very forthright, well-spoken president, Paul Darty. Uh, to Paul, to all the officers of NAFA, to your board of directors, bless you for what you do. And I love your, your PAC infomercials. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for committing your voices of our industry. In our current world, we're all witness to disorder, confusion, more often than we wish. Just this week, we heard of the horrible terrorist attack at Manchester Arena Monday night in Great Britain. North Korea continues its saber rattling. We saw the release of the White House budget amidst partisan rancor, and I will tell you, this is as much acidic partisanship as I have ever seen in the nation's capital. There are times when we must step back and remember President Abraham Lincoln's admonition to appeal to the better angels of our nature. In Washington, D.C., there are still such moments that indeed look to the better angel of our nature. For example, just last month, not too far from here, a horse-drawn casket carried an American hero. Former astronaut, U.S. Senator John Glenn, through Arlington National Cemetery to his final resting place. At a private service on the cemetery grounds, the acting NASA Administrator Robert Lightfoot said, quote, John was more than an astronaut. He was an icon of our American spirit. I first met John Glenn in 1993 on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and we stayed friends the remainder of his life. Just a couple of years ago, a package arrived at the ACLI offices for me. It was a replica of Friendship 7, John Glenn's space capsule. On it, he wrote to Dirk, John Glenn, accompanied by a, a wonderful note. 
Let me tell you about the man that I was honored to call my friend and to serve with on the United States Senate Armed Services Committee. Fifty-five years ago, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. During the Mercury 7 astronauts era, my mom would get her three sons up at three or four in the morning, whatever was necessary, to watch every launch. She knew the bravery it took for these brave astronauts to enter a capsule that would then catapult them by rockets into the heavens. She wanted us to realize the history being created and the sacrifices of so many to get us there. After a successful launch, Friendship 7 was placed into orbit 150 miles above the Earth's surface. That's a little further than the distance between Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. Friendship 7 was traveling at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. At that speed, that would get us from here to New York City in 45 seconds. <laughs> During the almost five-hour flight, John circled Earth three times. The temperature inside the capsule at times reached 108 degrees, but his flight suit kept it bearable. Not everything went as planned on that historic flight. This is a view of the Friendship 7 instrument panel. Key indicators started lighting up. For example, the autopilot was not working. John had to switch to manual hands-on steering of the spacecraft. He had to take control of the capsule for all three orbits. He was in charge. When it was time to return, the angle of reentry into the Earth's atmosphere was critical too shallow, and, and the capsule would just bounce off into the atmosphere. If this happened, nothing could be done to bring him home. Too steep, and he would perish in a fiery flash. One key safety element to protect him was the heat shield. But then the light for segment 51, monitoring the heat shield, began blinking indicating danger. The heat shield may be coming loose. The loss of that final safety net would lead to his demise. He would perish. People throughout the world learned of the seriousness of the situation. Collectively, hopes and prayers throughout the world were given for this brave man. It was as though all humanity was with him in that capsule. The immortal words uttered by fellow astronaut Scott Carpenter captured the spirit and the hopes of millions. Godspeed, John Glenn. John Glenn, of course, survived his descent back to Earth. Last December, I got up at 4 a.m. once again for John Glenn, this time to attend his memorial service in Ohio. Since that time, I've reflected on his gift to me. If we use that space capsule as a symbol of humanity, and if our industry is mission control, a team of experts, then our mission is to bring them in with safety and with dignity. So let's ask, what are the instrument panel indicator lights telling us? First off, the conditions have changed. We've gone from a defined benefit atmosphere where humanity's retirement path was on autopilot to a defined contribution mode where we're all hands-on for the entire flight of retirement. Savings rates have been falling. The net worth of people between the ages of 55 to 64 has been declining. It's the wrong slope. But what can we do? Our industry's role is particularly important because the heat shield for our capsule of humanity, Social Security, is in jeopardy. Our segment 51 light is blinking. In 2034, not long after the last of the baby boomer generation is tucked into retirement, the government 
is slated to notify Social Security recipients of a 21 to 27 percent reduction across the board in benefits. That means there's not as much fuel for retirement as anybody thought. Now, we all know that Social Security was never intended to be anyone's sole source of retirement. The reality is that it is for many. And they're going to take a direct hit. Among elderly Social Security beneficiaries, 21% of married couples and about 43% of single people rely on Social Security for virtually all of their income. That's not within our jurisdiction, of course. That's the responsibility of Congress. But we can help Congress see the full picture and recognize that our industry can supplement the public safety net. An array of indicator lights signal the always changing legislative and regulatory environment. Kevin mentioned tax reform. Let me give you a bit of background. We started the year with both houses of Congress and the White House controlled by Republicans. And there was an atmosphere of possibility about doing big things in Washington, D.C. Now, Mac McClarty, who was chief of staff to President Bill Clinton, spoke recently reflecting on the first hundred days of President Bill Clinton. And Mac told me, he said, you must have a victory. Your first major effort must be a victory. A new administration establishes momentum with legislative victories. For President Clinton's administration, the victory was narrow thin. Their attempt was to pass President Clinton's budget. They won by one vote in the House, and they had to have Vice President Al Gore break the tie in the Senate. But in Washington, a win is a win, no matter how narrow. So far, this administration and Congress have gotten off to a rocky start. The administration's first major legislative action was an attempt to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, as you know. First attempt was not successful. Now the Trump administration needs to parlay momentum that they finally gain with the passage of the second attempt at the American Health Care Act this month. Some say it was risky, a risky move for the administration to bring the health care bill up so soon and risk that critical first win. So why did they do it? What's it have to do with tax reform? Because if the administration successfully eliminates the taxes tied to the Affordable Care Act as part of its repeal and replace efforts, they remove close to a trillion dollars from the Joint Committee on Taxation's 10-year revenue baseline. And here's how. If the Affordable Care Act is repealed, many tax provisions will also be removed. Then Congress can use a 10-year baseline on a lower revenue model. The lower the revenue baseline, the less revenue a reform tax system will need to generate for the reform to be scored as revenue neutral. This is a reality that's very, very important. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan and the Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady, because they want tax reform to be revenue neutral. Now, President Trump's tax plan doesn't include much detail. It did not up until today. Only broad approaches. But here's what we do know. It would cut the 35% corporate rate to 15%. Small businesses would benefit. Private businesses that pay through the individual income tax code, that 39.6%, they'd see a big cut. Top White House economic advisor Gary Cohn and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin are leading the White House tax reform efforts. Those gentlemen are at the table with Paul Ryan and Kevin Brady. But it's kind of interesting because Mr. Cohen and Mr. Mnuchin are Democrats. 
Mr. Ryan, Mr. Brady are Republicans, so they do not necessarily see eye to eye philosophically. We know President Trump is not as concerned if his tax plan is revenue neutral because he believes that it will create so much good for the economy that it will pay for itself. At a press conference on tax reform, Mr. Cohn said that the individual tax rate cuts would be financed through economic growth and elimination of most tax breaks. However, he added, quote, home ownership, charitable giving, and retirement savings would be protected, unquote. That is a significant statement for this industry. This is very consistent with what Mr. Cohn had told me in a separate meeting. But Speaker Ryan says it has to be revenue neutral. This meteor shower of tax reform could hold peril for the industry if not navigated properly. Whatever way the tax reform deal shakes out, we have been preparing for tax reform for years. And when ACLI and NAFA work together, we send a powerful message to Congress. Any proposal, whether it's related to product or company taxation, that would interfere with our historic mission of helping American families would be vigorously opposed by our organizations. <laughs> 75 million American families rely on our industry's products and services for their financial and their retirement security. That's a powerful message. Our organizations have used our collective voices, our, our vast memberships, to amplify the industry's concerns over tax reform proposals. And we've used them to profound effect. Chairman Brady recognizes the industry's value. Speaker Ryan does too. We've met with them and with their staff on many, many occasions. Earlier this year, we met with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And in that lunch at the ACLI offices, here's what he said. He said, with a pending retirement crisis, during tax reform, your greatest message is, do not damage the industry that is part of the solution to a government safety net that is too thin. We couldn't have said it better. Please, please keep in mind and remind yourselves and remind everybody on Capitol Hill, we are part of the solution. We are not part of the problem. <laughs> but we'll not only fight to prevent any damage to the industry. We'll seize any chance that arises to promote our industry in tax reform. And why not? The arguments are on our side. Another indicator is flashing bright yellow, meaning caution. The light on fiduciary reform, which Kevin just articulated. And it's flashing erratically. We've received so many different signals from the courts, from Congress, from the Trump administration. As you all now probably know, Secretary Acosta announced the applicability date of significant provisions of the fiduciary rule would not be delayed beyond June 9th. I'm very disappointed with that decision. I know Paul is. Kevin, I'm sure all of you are. ACLI and NAFA have both worked tirelessly on this issue. I sent Secretary Acosta a letter a couple of weeks ago urging him to delay the entire rule until the examination is complete to the satisfaction of the President of the United States. ACLI submitted comments to the Department of Labor on April 17, 2017. We urged the Department to revoke and replace the regulation. 
the Secure Family Co Coalition, which NAFA is a part of, printed that full-page ad which you saw in Roll Call, a main paper on Capitol Hill. That ad urged Secretary Acosta, the administration, Congress, and the states to get it right. We provided the Secretary with key arguments, with facts. We told him that the, the rule harms investors, disrupts the marketplace, and increases litigation risks and costs to the consumers. We also pointed out serious flaws in the regulatory impact analysis, an analysis the President asked them to redo. The Department acknowledged last month that a 60-day delay was insufficient to conduct an appropriate examination of the regulation and its impact. Now Secretary Acosta has decided to move forward with significant provisions of the regulation, and it's going to conduct the examination while parts of the rule are in effect. This will continue to create uncertainty, confusion in the retirement marketplace. So what do we do next? We double down on our efforts toward Congress, the states, the Department of Labor, with other stakeholder groups, and in the courts. We need your voices now more than ever. I appreciated the statement that Kevin put out, released it today. And let me just tell you, good people, friends, your fly-in is extremely well-timed. Tomorrow, you'll be able to look Congress in the face and to share real stories of how the fiduciary rule limits choice and has a detrimental impact on everyday Americans. And Paul said this so beautifully moments ago. No one can tell the story better than you. You live it day in and day out, and you can reference specific anecdotes about what this meant to your consumer, to your customer, to your neighbor, your friend. That's why there's another section of lights on our instrument panel. But that one's for opportunity. One of our biggest opportunities is partnership. We need each other. You are without question some of the most effective spokespeople to carry this message. And why? Because you are Main Street. You're not Wall Street. If you scan through the news, you will quickly determine that anything labeled Wall Street is a political target. In an interview with Bloomberg News this month, President Trump said he wants to break up big banks. Well, folks, anything that our industry can do to prevent being perceived is Wall Street is critical to this industry. You are Main Street. And you hold the keys to middle America and to lower income Americans who are going to need help in that glide slope of life. An incredible thing happens when Main Street America comes to Washington, D.C. You bring with you the perspective the perspective of where you live, where we all live, where you work, who you serve. Your voice awakens Washington, D.C. You might wonder, though, if you make a difference. You might even get kind of tired of this. You might even be feeling a little bit of fatigue. Let me tell you a story about a man named William Loncarek. William was in the Army in the 250th Field Artillery Battalion during World War II. He was at Omaha Beach on D-Day. When asked about his part in the Normandy invasion, William said, I was the one that carried the maps. And he was. His job, his big moment, 
was to carry maps from the ship to a designated position, position on Omaha Beach. And he had to do it without getting shot or lost. He wasn't a commander. He didn't lead a charge of soldiers. He wasn't calling out plans on a radio. He was simply supposed to carry the maps. But what did they need the maps for? To command troops, to send location information, to inform artillery. So you see, William was the man who carried the maps, but he was also the carrier of the logistics. He held the foundation of the tactics. Today, not many people know William's name. He was one of thousands of men who stormed the beach that day. He's one of even thousands more who continued to serve our country. He retired as a major in 1981. His story is archived along with countless others in the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. In an interview with the Veterans History Project, William mentions his role as carrier of the maps, as if it were only a minor part of the invasion. But William Longcrick's job was critical. Without the maps, the generals could not coordinate the infantry and the artillery to make the Battle of Normandy successful. We may never know the impact of his role that day. Our industry has charged you with the role of carrying our industry's story. Please remember that as you're meeting on Capitol Hill this week with members of Congress, with members of their staff about tax reform, about fiduciary. Those might be the very actions and comments that you make that plant the seeds for change, positive change. Progress is never clean. In fact, sometimes it's messy. But when you get to that moment, when all you have done and all you have fought for is achieved, what an incredible moment. And what is it all for? Remember that precious cargo in our space capsule? They need the best effort from each one of us in mission control so that the mission of concluding their life's journey, their guide slope is on target, done properly, and done with dignity. A few years ago, John Glenn was asked, after making space history and serving 24 years in the Senate, what would you most want to be remembered? And he answered, I don't know. I'm not interested in my legacy. I made up a new word, livacy. That sentiment is probably true of all who are in that symbolic space capsule and the respective orbits of life. And you really are mission control of an incredibly strong and vibrant and great industry. And millions of people, whether they know it or not, are counting on you to be innovative and to lead. To capture a quote attributed to NASA, I believe it applies to the life insurance industry. Failure is not an option. And as John Glenn said at NASA's 50th anniversary in 2008, where we go in exploration is certainly important. But what we learn from each of those steps along the way will benefit every man, woman, and child in our nation, and eventually around the world. 
Friends, your steps tomorrow can potentially benefit every man, woman, and child of our nation. So rightfully have bounce in your step. You're the messengers to carry the message to the hill. What a mission. How magnificent. Godspeed, John Glenn, and Godspeed to all of you. Thank you. What a great advocate for the industry. Governor, thank you again for being here. Thank you for your strong support of NAFA. Thank you for your strong support of our advisors. And we will make sure that we represent the industry well tomorrow.